Hello, my name is Vince Marchetti. I am a member of the Web3D Consortium, and I am about to deliver the next entry in our webinar series for 2022. The title of this webinar is Authoring Interactive Dynamic X3D and GLTF Together. When I'm not working on X3D, I am a consultant and contractor working in civil engineering, uh, doing programming and engineering of GPS applications in agricultural and civil engineering. This, what you're viewing today, is a re-recording of the webinar first presented on May 31st, 2022. That was delivered live on the web. Uh, there were some technical issues with that recording, so this is a repeat recording of the same material. When I gave the live recording, I was able, using the chat features of our application, to give so, some links to the, to the audience because this webinar is structured around three live web pages. So let me go to the next slide. And if you're watching this on a YouTube or other video streaming, this will perhaps direct you to how to download those 3D web pages on your own browser to view them during during the presentation. The, the links are available on the Web3D Consortium webpage devoted to this webinar. So I would invite you to go to the uh, Web3D website at www.web3d.org. I give the full URL on the screen here, but as well, if you do use our search function on the home page of that website, looking for the search terms webinar dynamic X3D GLTF, uh, you should be very quickly see this page come up and the links I invite you to look at are down here under featured scenes. So that will help you uh, follow along. You'll be able to interact with the scenes directly on your own web browser as I illustrate them and show them with the slides and on the web browser that I'm running uh, that I am recording here. I give an example. What you're looking at now is my live web page of one of the scenes I'll be showing. Uh, this is just a preview of what's coming up, and I hope to show you how the power of X3D and GLTF together uh, let, let you create scenes like this. Let me start by giving a quick overview of X, both X3D and GLTF, the two technologies which this webinar is discussing merging together. X3D is a standard, an international standard, is a description of a 3D scene graph. And the X3D standard is developed and promoted, and we offer these webinars by the Web3D Consortium. It's a membership organization, and you're all invited to go to our website at web3d.org. You'll find lots of information on the X3D standard, as well as the official standard documents, which are available for viewing free of charge, and the opportunities to join as a member uh, and take advantage of, of some of the uh, special benefits we offer our members, such as access to uh, working groups and the ability to participate in the development of the standard. So let me describe what this standard is. X3D is a formal specification for describing a 3D scene which can be visualized on a computing device. That's a very general statement, but the idea is that Using X3D, you can describe a scene, much as the one I just showed earlier. It can be viewed on a desktop device, a mobile device. It's available in web pages and looking forward, uh, available in uh, VR, AR headsets as well. And the, this is a specification, a standard, which has been existed for 20 years. It has been able to adapt itself and be adapted as new technology comes online. 
So typical example, typical elements of a scene that would be described using X3D. Obviously, there's geometry, three-dimensional geometry. These are the shapes. This is the things you see on the screen. And X3D supports both what we call primitive shapes, a box, a sphere, a cone, as well as meshes, which allow pretty arbitrary curved complex surfaces. And what I would think of as higher order or more sophisticated mathematical descriptions descriptions of shapes, such as NURBS technology. If you're familiar with the idea of NURBS curves, they are commonly used in uh, computer-aided design to accurately describe curved surfaces. A 3D scene graph described in X3D includes materials and textures. And by material, we basically mean the, the outward appearance of a shape. Uh, we can think of material, what it actually is made of. So that would include such things as color and how it reacts to light. Well, light bounces off in a diffuse way. There are specular reflections that is uh, tending toward a mirror kind of appearance, as well as what we call emissive color, which is you know, you consider the object as somehow glowing in a color in the absence of external light. Textures, if you're familiar with that term from uh, 3D graphics or computer graphics really refers to a, in a sense, a painting over a surface. And this painting or drawing is derived from a surface, the same idea as a, as a, 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 a two dimensional photograph or a drawing. A texture is kind of wrapped around the geometry of that, that, is, that it is applied to and enables a more detailed appearance and we'll be seeing examples of texture particularly in those goblets a 3d scene graph in x3d includes lighting overhead lights or ambient light and we're going to see examples of how those can be used to enhance the appearance of a scene it can be a 3d scene in x3d includes text which can be floating in three-dimensional space and it includes what we call transform descriptions, which really are the, uh, the placement and rotation orientation of a 3D object. And what we'll see is in the 3D scene graph generated by uh, X3D or described by X3D, all of these properties, all of these elements of the scene graph can be by dynamic, that is they uh, change over time, and they, they're interactive in the sense that uh, the actions of the user using a mouse, using HTML controls can change the scene. What else does X3D have? X3D has an internal programming system where events, and events can be generated by an internal clock, uh, activity sensors, the user does something, and external client code. So this would be in the case of uh, if you have a web page or other program that has buttons, those can control the 3D scene. X3D scenes can be stored in several formats. Uh, there's an XML format. Vermal, if again, if you're familiar with the history of 3D graphics, Vermal was uh, an early 3D programming uh, environment or, or format developed in the 90s. And X3D is a, a direct successor, extension, standardization of the vermal format. And in many ways, a, a vermal scene that 20, 25 years old can be very, e either is already viewable in uh, X3D, or it can be very easily or simply modified, bring it up to date in a, an, an X3D viewer. An important point is that X3D itself is not software. X3D is a specification, it's a standards document. So we depend on viewer applications to load X3D scenes and to display them. That's my brief overview of X3D. I, I mentioned there is uh, much more information on our website. Now let me give a similar, very fast 
uh, overview of what GLTF is. GLTF is being developed, promoted by the Kronos Group, and I give a link to their website, uh, Kronos.org, and Kronos actually supports, develops many standards pertinent to, to 3D visualization, including the augmented reality uh, VR applications. GL, and I will just give the, the, their own thumbnail description of what GLTF is. GLTF is a royalty-free specification for the efficient transmission and loading of 3D scenes and models by engines and applications. So the important points for this, this presentation are as X3D is not software, neither is GLTF software. GLTF, it's a specification, it's a document, it describes how to format and transmit data. It requires a software application that can implement loading and displaying GLTF content. I said it's a specification and at just as X3D is a standard ratified by ISO. GLTF in its second version, GLTF 2.0, is being submitted to ISO in the present time uh, for approval as an ISO standard. For purposes of today's presentation, I'm just going to concentrate on the, the part of GLTF which provides an efficient format for sending what I think of as high density data. This is complex geometry, which is, uh, has lots of coordinates to, to dis accurately describe a complex geometry. And as I mentioned, textures are essentially large images which are painted on the outside of geometry. So textures themselves can contain quite a lot of data. And GLTF is an efficient format for transmitting that data from a server to a client application. And GLTF is in some sense optimized for transmitting to a WebGL browser. So it's optimized for use over the internet. But it's optimized for transmitting from a server to a client application. So for the purposes of this presentation, we're going to think of as GLTF is just a, a useful format, an efficient format for a web page using X3D to download or to use this high density data that's available on an external server. So now I'll, again, a quick overview of X3D combined with GLTF. X3D has always had the ability to include an external resource file, but only when that resource file was also an X3D. So an X3D scene could include, by reading another file, perhaps over the internet or over your computer desktop, a file that either contained a smaller scene that in some sense was included in the, the, the original scene, or could it down, it could read in uh, shapes that were defined in X3D and place that in a scene. And th that feature of X3D was included in what we call the inline node. With the latest version of X3D, and that would be X3D version 4, the abilities of the inline node have been formally extended to include specifying in addition to specifying an X3D resource, it can also specify a GLTF asset or a GLTF resource available from a server. Now, I mentioned that uh, GL X3D itself is not uh, software. We rely on browsers or viewers that read an X3D file. For a long time, different browsers have uh, allowed the, as an extension to the standard, 
loading other formats besides X3D, commonly uh, OBJ, which is another uh, three-dimensional format, or STL, those are the stereo lithography, 3D printing files, so some, some other uh, 3D formats, but those were always extensions and, and not included in the standard uh, X3D specification. And for, again, for, for a few years now, a few of the browsers have experimented with loading or allowing GLTF in an X3D scene, first at GLTF version one, and then the latest version of GLTF, GLTF two. What is different with X3D version four is that that ability to include X3D, include GLTF in X3D has been formally specified, and some other features of X3D have been extended and updated to take advantage of uh, some of the capabilities offered in GLTF. And I'll be talking about uh, some of those capabilities, including what's called physically based rendering later on in one of my example scenes. So to, what we have available now is the specification, which now includes uh, GLTF as part of the standard. And I, when I gave this uh, talk on May 31st, this was a news flash, literally only several hours old. It's now about five days later, but the XVD version four specification document has finally been completed to the point that it's been submitted to ISO for ratification as an international standard. Uh, that balloting and approve well balloting and hopefully approval process should start imminently and so we're looking uh, in in the hopefully again before the end of the year this uh, inclusion or x3d version 4 including gltf will be part of the international standard but the capabilities we're going to look today are already available in two of our browsers which have, have mature uh, implementations of this, including GLTF. Those two browsers that we're aware of so far are X3DOM. X3DOM is an X3D viewer, which is implemented in JavaScript, uses WebGL for 3D rendering, and this is directly viewable on web pages. And that's what I'll be showing uh, in a few moments for as my examples. There is also a desktop viewer uh, called View 3D Scene. Uh, is download. It is runs as a desktop application in the in the common operating system environments, and those would be Windows, Linux, and uh, the Mac. Uh, I will not show examples of this today. I'll point out in a later slide that that. GLTF viewer, X3D viewer that allowed GLTF was the subject of one of our earlier webinars this year. I'm not showing it because I'll be concentrating on, on what's available over the web, but I will say for authors and people that's learning about GLTF that this view 3D scene is not only a viewer, but it offers a lot of authoring and conversion utilities as part of the application. So it is a, a really a very useful toolkit for those creating um, X3D content that uses GLTF. So today I'm going to, about to start showing some examples of GLTF representing discrete objects, a piece of coral, a car, uh, drinking cups, and how to use X3D as a presentation environment for those GLTF resources. Let me start with my first example, and I'm first time showing the uh, screenshot of this web page. In a moment, I'll switch over to show uh, this this three scene. Uh, visible in my browser live. And again, you are invited if you're watching this over a streaming video to uh, look at the real or the web page live yourself. And I give the URL here as well. 
first, as an introduction, uh, GLTF has become a very popular format for collections of 3D resources to, to make their resources available for download, or in some cases, even available for direct loading into the uh, into your, your web page. Uh, of a collection I'm real happy to talk about is from the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. They offer many of the 3D models uh, from their collection at Smithsonian 3D. Uh, these models include fossils. They include historical items from their collection, including things like the Morse telegraph key from the 19th century, including various uh, statues from the statuary collection. It includes what I call astronaut stuff. It includes things from current pop culture, such as Selena's leather jacket, and much, much more. Uh, most of these resources are available for download under public domain licensing. And I have this point that if uh, you are someone who has ever paid a uh, federal income tax or federal taxes to the US government, you've likely already paid for this. So uh, you have the opportunity to make, take advantage of this uh, resource from the Smithsonian. What I've chosen to show here is one of their item from their large collection of coral uh, from their natural history collection. And let me switch now from the um, PowerPoint slide to the live web page, which is right here. So now what you're looking at now is my web browser uh, running this model. And what I am trying to show for each of my three examples is what showing in X3D can add to simply the object uh, as downloaded. So if you go to the original uh, model as viewable on the Smithsonian 3D website, and the link down here is down here, the leptosis model provided by the Smithsonian Institute, you'll basically see just the coral shape that you see here. Uh, and, and you will see the annotation. Annotation, uh, for the purposes of this presentation, by annotation, I mean these text uh, descriptions, which can be sort of attached to the, the model. Now, uh, the annotation as viewable on uh, the, the Smithsonian website and the annotation as provided here is actually not part of the GLTF resource. The GLTF resource uh, is really just the, the coral shape and the coral coloring, the coral texture. And I can show that quickly by simply turning off the annotation. And this is essentially what uh, the, the shape you see here is what is downloaded from the Smithsonian website. The features which I try to highlight that are made available by X3D are the annotation, which I just showed, um, and the lighting. So to my, not an expert in, in coral biology, but to me, the, the, the challenge is something like this presents uh, to a viewer is, it is a complex shape. Uh, and if you look at their collection of coral, you see a great variety of shapes and colors. Um, and not sure that we can understand the shape, in the sense of why it exactly has this shape, but as, a, as a, to get to that point, we really, the 3D visualization really helps us explore this shape, visualize this shape, uh, hopefully as much as you can. It, obviously, it would be better to have the original object in your hand. You could feel it. You would have better uh, you know, tactile uh, perception of it, but, uh, 3D visualization it gets us toward understanding, uh, describing the shape. One thing which might be helpful in understanding the shape is, is to allow us to vary the lighting that we see. So using X3D, I've given us some additional control over the lighting with these checkboxes on the web page. And 
as an all content author trying to make something simple for now, I simply have two sources of lighting. One is an overhead light and the other is a headlight. The headlight is a feature of X3D and the way we think about it is exactly that. It is a light which uh, sort of attached to your, your viewer the, uh, pointing forward. Uh, so as you look at the uh, object from different angles using the mouse dragging, the headlight is always something looking straight forward the same way the viewer is, while the overhead light is fixed relative to the to the object. I have the overhead light turned off now. If I turn that on, you'll see. I chose to make the overhead light yellow, but again, that, that's one more feature. And obviously, if we added more lights, we, we may get better perception of, of the three-dimensional shape. If they have lights of slightly different color, it would kind of change the highlighting and the shading in a way that might bring out the shape better. So I've applied an overhead light and we can see if, if we look at it this way, we are looking directly from overhead. So the light, the overhead light is in a sense behind us. While if we come underneath here, we don't see any of that yellow overhead light. We only have the uh, illumination of the headlight. And again, as a further means of exploring, I can turn off the headlight using the web page. Obviously looks looks black or very dark. We're still getting some of the overhead light there. And my thought is, and this is something which uh, probably with better authoring than I provided or more sophisticated uh, knowledge of how to present these things, uh, by giving the viewer the opportunity to control the lighting to some extent, we can help the viewer understand this complex shape. So again, we can turn on the headlight and the overhead light independently. And I've only, for simplicity, I've only included two lights and I've only been able to turn them on and off. In a moment, our next example will show the advantage of changing the intensity of the lighting. But again, that would be another sense of control of interactivity to help the user understand the shape. If we turn off all the lights, obviously it turns dark. And turn the annotation back on to see that. Uh, I have simply copied the annotation that the, uh, the Smithsonian provided in, in one of their displays. I give a link to the Smithsonian version of the annotation down on this web page. Obviously, we could add even more annotation uh, to explain different features of this coral. So I've just showed the, this, this example as a live web page. Let me quickly summarize uh, what features of this visualization came from X3D and what were provided by X3, by, by X3D. Okay, so of this coral scene, a single GLTF resource supplied the mesh geometry, that's, a, that's that complex geometry of the coral, and also the texture, but in this case, the texture is the, 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 the coloration of the outside of the coral. X3D has implemented an X3DOM supplied. One is the viewpoint. And that's simply, the viewpoint is simply where you're looking from. And as an author, I chose what would be the initial placement of the viewpoint uh, when, the, when the page was loaded. And also the rules for how the viewpoint changed as, as the user manipulated it, the scene with the mouse. X3D also supply the annotation and some of the parts of that annotation are the idea of a billboard node. A billboard node is a feature of X3D and it, it's, a, it's a dynamic feature. Essentially what it does is it allows everything inside that billboard container to be rotated so that it's always facing the viewer. 
So if we go back to that shape, that annotation is always facing us even as we manipulate the, the shape in a, over a wide range of angles. So if, if, if that annotation were to rotate as if it were sort, sort of fixed to the shape, it could be upside down on its side and more difficult to read. So that, that billboard node is what uh, counteracts the effect of different viewpoints. The text node, again, X3D gives us a way of uh, displaying formatted text on this, right in the scene, in a sense, floating in, in floating in 3D space. X3D gives us what it's called an index face set, but it's simply a, a geometry description that allows the shape of this tag to be displayed as a, as a white background on the text. And X3D also supplies the little red ball, which kind of uh, alerts the viewer that uh, this annotation is attached to the coral and the line connecting the red ball with the, the annotation. And X3D supplies what we call a switch node. And by here, the switch means switch between visible and not visible. So the switch node is what lets, and the control of the switch node is what lets us show or hide or show that annotation. Whoops. X3D also supplied, as I explained, uh, the two types of lighting used in this source, a directional light from above and a headlight that follows the viewer. The other important thing that the X3D uh, supplies to viewing this GLTF resource is the ability to control all these elements. In this case, we're controlling them from an HTML web page. So that is something which is implemented by our X3D, X3DOM JavaScript library. It allows the X3D scene to be modified and controlled by these checkboxes that are part of HTML. So the, 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 the control of this uh, scene with these checkboxes is a fairly simple and standard bit of web page programming that would be really should be familiar to anyone who, who does, you know, any web page developer. Uh, so it, it is a, a pretty simple uh, system of, of controlling the features of, of the scene from, from web page input controls. And I won't show it here, but if you are interested or conversant in, in web page programming, if you look at the page source of, of this scene and the other scenes I'll show, you'll see the page source is actually quite uh, simple. It's, it's compact. It's not complex. Uh, and it should be a familiar simple JavaScript uh, function calls. What you will not see, fortunately, is all of that high density data I've been talking about. You will not see lots and lots of numbers for the coordinates of this uh, complicated coral mesh shape. And you will, see not, you will not see lots of pixel values for the texture. Let me go to my next example, which I call the car. And I pointed out earlier that GLTF offers some features which uh, had to be added or were added to X3D version four to take full advantage of what the GLTF spec now offers. And a great example of that is what's called physically based rendering. So in physically based rendering, those materials which describe the, the outer, the, the, the external appearance of, of, of a 3D object um, are, are based on physics-inspired physics optical properties of hard materials. So these are really intended to give a more realistic rendering. And a very rough way um, in the, the shading or, or the material uh, 
description available in X3D up through versions three. Uh, really, the, the the properties of a of a of a of a, of a solid object and material were a, a simple color uh, defined by red, green, and blue values, and really in only sort of three uh, broad optical properties. One is how light scatters in a diffuse way. One is sort of the sort of the specular reflection or mirror reflections. And uh, one is w whether this material actually glows without any external lights. Well, this physically based rendering adds, in a sense, more complicated and hopefully more realistic optical properties of a material. And uh, it was necessary to include those capabilities in X3D version 4 in order to take advantage of the physically based rendering that could be transmitted or transferred down in a GLTF asset. Now, uh, one of our X, one of our important uh, contributors to X3D, Michaelis Cambarellis, gave an earlier webinar in this series on physically based rendering in X3D4 using GLTF. And the recording of that webinar is available on our X3D website. Uh, Michaelis is also the developer of the View 3D Scene uh, X3D viewer that I talked about earlier. And if you, if you want to see his description of how to use the View 3D Scene to take advantage of, of GLTF uh, as part of X3D, you're invited to view his webinar. And Michaelis uh, explains in much more detail than I have uh, the reasoning and capabilities of physically based rendering. The example I've chosen here is, is a car. Uh, it is a commercial product of a company called Hume 3D, a uh, European company, uh, which offers a large variety of 3D models and a, including a very large collection of cars. Uh, so I invite you to look on, on their website for this. Uh, the cars are not created by a scan of a physical artifact as the Coral was. These cars are developed, these models of cars are developed as CAD, basically CAD files or CAD designs based on the, the real dimensions of, of a car. And the materials, particularly the hard metal surface of a car, is defined using these physically based rendering uh, materials. So I was interested not just in showing a car, but I was interested again in, for my own purposes, understanding how physically based rendering could improve the rendering of a, a CAD model, in this case, a car, and again, under different kinds of lighting. Because again, the physically based rendering is really determines how light interacts with the geometry and the appearance of, of an object. So the, the car you see here, and let me switch over to my web browser view. Here it is in the web browser, so this is a live view. And I've, I'll describe this and again, break down the components, but the, the model purchase from Hume 3D really was just the car. The road and lighting and so on are provided by X3D, and I'll describe that in more detail. First, I just want to, again, run through the different controls, because, again, I'm interested in uh, understanding for myself how lighting can be used to better uh, convey the appearance of this car. So in this case, I uh, provided in the X3D scene three lights. The first, again, an overhead white light, which I give a, I allow the user to control the uh, the intensity of that light. A ambient white light, which can be considered light, which comes in some sense uniformly over all directions. Again, a white color. And uh, the, the, the third light I provided, I was sort of inspired by the idea of uh, looking at it from a, a setting sun. 
So it's, it is an orange light coming from a low angle close to the horizon. And the, the web controls allow the user freedom to simply modify those. And if you download this page, you can play, work around with those. We see as we switch to the, make the overhead light brighter, it kind of shows the top. We tone it down a little bit. We there, we can up the ambient intensity change that and finally we can modify the again this uh, light coming in from from a low angle and really again uh, obviously the, the you can uh, it's a matter of, of authoring expertise and, and authoring artistic ability to put more lighting or at least the, the correct lighting in the correct places. I've really only scratched the surface of what's capable here. Uh, I, I do not, in this model, have the ability to change the, the direction of each of these lights interactively. Uh, that certainly would be possible in X3D. It's just for the simplicity of this scene, uh, giving you a simpler example, I only allow changing the, the intensity of each light but all the properties of, of these lighting could potentially be uh, modified from the web page, the color, the intensity, and the placement of the lights. Rack it down. So let me summarize again in the same way, what are the components of this car scene and first, a GLTF resource supplied, again, what I call the high density data resources. The complex mesh geometry as created by CAD software for the car. And actually the geometry includes the interior of the car. And I invite you, if you have your web browser, you actually can zoom in and look around inside the interior of this model. Uh, th this the, the, the geometry supplied in this 3D model actually includes over a hundred uh, individual parts as meshes. So it really is a very complex geometry. So that was that's what is available from the GLTF resource loaded from the server that this high density data. The X3D as implemented in X3DOM, what it provided was, well, first just the sort of the appearance to set the scene, the road and the yellow stripe. It included the lighting, which I just demonstrated from above, uh, the ambient lighting and an orange, kind of a sunset kind of a light, which the intensities of which can be modified using the sliders, the HTML sliders. And I, Notice this just a few moments before I gave the webinar the first time. I thought in the interest of honesty, I would just leave it as it was. In this case, the person who made this scene, and it was me, kind of left behind something. And you can just see it if I zoom in on it. There's that green line. And you might also see a, a, a red line and a blue line. And actually, if we go into the car, it's still there. So uh, this is something which I use in creating this scene. I add red, green, and blue lines to help identify the origin and the coordinate system of my XPD coordinates. It helps me place things correctly. And in the same way that perhaps someone in a factory might leave a gum wrapper under the seat of the car uh, that they just made, I left that little tool behind. Uh, and I thought it was only fair or only being honest that I leave it there. So that's what it is, uh, but it would be very easy to remove that.
The last example I'll show, and it's the one I showed at the very beginning for a moment, is what I call the goblet scene. Let me arrange this better. Uh, the theme of this uh, scene is the ability to make a, a like web world is called a mashup. I combine resources, individual resources combined in a way that they were, were perhaps not originally intended. Uh, let me switch to the uh, live web page view of this. Let me stop them spinning for the moment. These three drinking cups or goblets were downloaded from the Sketchfab website. Sketchfab is a uh, site you may be familiar with. It offers models, 3D models uh, that are shared by their users. Some are available for free on the different types of permissions. Some are actually for sale for a fee. Uh, the three that I have I locate, identified here and put in a single scene are free models that the uh, users, the, the, the creators, were willing to share under uh, essentially open source or almost public domain licensing, different versions of the Creative Commons list. So I'm, I'm thankful to the users for that, the people, the creators. And I have, uh, in, on this web page, I've listed these sites or the links for the original models the, the, the you give appropriate attribution credit to the users and describe the sites or the, the licenses uh, applied to these uh, models. So I've created this by downloading or by loading using that inline node, the three individual resources. And the features that I wanted to, to highlight that XUD provides is, well, first I was able to, just present them and show them in kind of a unified scene. And we could simply uh, look around, this, look at these cups from different angles. But one thing X3D lets us do as a part of the authoring process is to animate their placement. I described that earlier, the so-called transform nodes in X3D. And I, that's controllable or turn that that ability on and off from the web page, I turn that on and you will see that each of those three cups, goblets, uh, are rotating to allow you to see from, from all sides. The other feature I wanted to uh, highlight is, is your better control of you directing the user or giving the user a specific viewpoint or, or in this sense, it's a close-up view that they maybe would find it hard to, to locate on their own. And in this case, the, I want to give a viewpoint of this one model, uh, which actually is, is a model uh, donated or, or uploaded to Sketchfab by the Science Museum Group in the UK. And it is a drinking cup uh, card from a coconut. And from far enough, far away, it's pretty hard to see. So I've given a control, again, controllable from the web browser, allowing us to zoom in and get a close-up on that. So from this close-up view, uh, we're e e easily able to see the, the everyday scenes uh, that a artisan of long ago <laughs> carved into a coconut uh, for the drinking cup. Let me uh, back up a little bit and just give an, another feature which I kind of had to add as an author. I've talked about lighting in my uh, previous two examples. And this, I did not realize it until I was working on this scene, actually was a, a pretty tricky thing for me to light correctly. And the problem was uh, that, white styrof that white Starbucks cup. That bright white uh, object is, in a sense, 
it gives some problem with the lighting, at least it is that if I give enough lighting or give more lighting here to better bring out the more detailed cups, that Starbucks turns into kind of a supernova effect on the scene. But what I was able to do as part of the animation that shows that viewpoint, uh, the close up on the coconut goblet, and you may not have noticed it the first time is at the same time that I apply the close up on the coconut, I also turn up the lighting. And if I do it again, or you do it from your live web browser, you may notice that. You may have noticed that, that the, the lighting got brighter just as I was zooming in. And then that enables us to better see this, uh, the, the detail carved in, into this coconut cup. And actually, I can still see the effect on that Starbucks cup if I just use the mouse control to zoom out. And you'll see that that bright white, light, bright white lighting on the Starbucks cup it 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 is it, it, it's too it's too bright in a sense. And I I'm aware that this is a this is why there is such a thing as, as lighting designers uh, for museums and for theater is that lighting is not a trivial issue in the real world and it's not a trivial issue in uh, computer graphics as well. Um, so this is something we could probably, or I could explore better in this. Let me just show that. So the, the, the interactive control available from this scene is that close-up view. All right, let me turn it back in and turn it back up. There we go. Back to our close-up. And also we can and this, this idea of, of starting and stopping the rotation is useful if you are looking at the, the coconut and you want to stop to better look at it stationary. So let me give my summary here of what are the components of this goblet scene and what X3D provided. First of all, the goblet scene had three separate GLTF resources, that is one each for the, the coconut goblet, that other drinking cup in the middle that had animals painted, carved and painted on, and the, the, the Starbucks coffee cup. Uh, the, the two older cups, the coconut cup and that middle cup were, were 3D physical scans of some kind of artifact. Uh, from a museum, and in one case, it was the creator's, uh, I think it was a household object. And the, the Starbucks cup was created with the modeling software as kind of a, a CAD model. The X3D as implemented in X3DOM provided, well, first of all, it allowed us to place all of these on that tabletop. Let me zoom out and show that. So the tabletop here is, is a simply a, is an X3D shape, and it's simply a box or a rectangular shape. So it's a very uh, succinct, brief description of a box given its three dimensions. Uh, the X3D also supplied the marble or the granite-like texture applied to that tabletop. The X3D applied that rotation of each cup so turning it on and off, or you see it rotating in place. The X3D supplied the, the lighting. Now, in this case, the lighting uh, was isn't controllable from the web page, but the X3D uh, does define the lighting of that. It can, the X3D supplies that close-up viewpoint, and again, the control of those features the rotation and the viewpoint controlled from HTML checkboxes. I've come to the closing of my talk. I just want to give a some few closing remarks. The purpose of this 3D visualization or any visualization is to tell a story. Uh, X3D is an open accessible standard. I mentioned earlier that the standard itself is available for viewing for free as, as web pages on the X3D website. 
We also offer on our X3D Consortium website various tutorial, other webinars, which will help you get started in authoring these scenes. It can be used by authors in new creative ways with the objective of telling those stories. And because it is an open and standards-based, using X3D does not tie you to a specific platform. You are not tied to a web platform or a desktop platform or a visual reality headset or a mobile device. All of those different platforms can be supported with it in the X3D format. You're not tied to language. That is, a, a C, you must be a C programmer, must be a whatever the language, you know, Visual Basic, you know, all the different development environments. I do much of my work that re does require pro programming in, in the Python language. Or, and it does not require particularly very specific uh, design tools, either proprietary open source. We can use Blender to create X3D. We can use ordinary text editors to create an X3D scene. However, uh, one barrier to authoring some of these complicated scenes is what we call the, is what I call the high density of data. That is those things, complicated geometry, complex textures, which require lots of numbers to define. Lots of numbers, piles of triangles and pixels. And that could be a barrier to authoring because in conventional X3D without using the inline node, all of that numerical data, coordinate data, is in the X3D file itself. So we can get files of megabytes of text and those are simply hard to work with. So the using a GLTF resource as presented in X3D in a sense gives you the best of both worlds. It gives you the high density data resources allow you access to these complex physical models and allows you to present those uh, using the open, flexible uh, features of, of X3D to tell your story. I thank you all for watching. And I again, I invite you to go to the uh, Web3D website for the additional resources and for information about the upcoming webinars offered in our 2022 uh, webinar series. Thank you again.